So is the PlayStation Portal a modern day Wii U or should you actually consider purchasing it? What's up everybody, Corey with Freaky Tech Reviews here and today we're gonna to be taking a look at the PlayStation Portal that I was finally able to grab. In my last Portal video, I questioned its existence and it actually became my most disliked video I've ever had on YouTube. So I'm looking forward to seeing if my thoughts remain consistent on it being a Sony cash grab or if you should actually consider getting it after all. In this video, I'll talk through the portal's physical features, system navigation, how it plays, what I like and dislike about it, and if it's worth $200 or if I still think it's a Sony cash grab. The portal is designed after the PS5's DualSense controller, although it is not exactly the same size or dimension. The joysticks are smaller and the handles are slightly more narrow because the top part of each handle doesn't continue into the body of the controller, but up into the handle itself. It still has the same tapered ends that I dislike so much about the DualSense controller, but overall, the spacing between the buttons feels almost identical to the DualSense. What sets the portal aside from other devices that can also access your PS5 online, kind of like using the GameSir G8 Galileo on your phone, are that it features the full capabilities of the DualSense controller experience with very good haptic feedback and the same adaptive triggers that make them feel weighted during gameplay. The example of this I come across most often is that when playing Madden, you feel the same amount of resistance against your finger when sprinting as you would with the DualSense itself. And aside from the normal buttons, I do think that Sony did a great job with button placement across the portal as the PlayStation button, options button, screen capture, and mute are all placed very well and easily reachable. And then on the shoulders of the portal, you'll find additional input buttons such as power for the portal, headphone connection button, and volume controls. And while the portal is designed to work with Sony's new wireless headsets, it does have a three and a half millimeter audio jack that's right next to the USB-C port that you use for charging. The screen itself is an eight inch LCD touchscreen that's capable of 60 frames a second at 1080p. This is an area that I wish Sony had thrown us a bit of a bone because an OLED display would have been really nice to have on it. The screen also has a black edge around it that you do get used to while gaming, but I would like to have seen a bezel to bezel display that didn't cut corners because it needed room for the joystick columns that cut into it. But overall, the screen is sharp and it looks great when playing games and it has a great brightness setting that allows you to drop it so low that you can easily play in the dark without disturbing others. Overall, I think the physical design looks sharp and I do like how it mirrors the design of all Sony created PS5 accessories and it kind of creates this PS5 ecosystem that reminds me of the aesthetics of Apple products. The only personal issue that I have is that it uses the DualSense controller handles, which I personally find very uncomfortable and they're quite small for my larger hands. But this actually leads me to today's sponsor, C2 Grips. While they don't fit on the portal itself, C2 Grips do solve the problem of how uncomfortable the DualSense controller is to hold. These grips simply slide onto the handles of your controller, twist into place, and provide a much more comfortable gaming experience. Sizes range from small to the extra larges that I use, and you can find more information on how to measure your hand for your size and the grips themselves in the description down below. I absolutely love C2 grips and I will not game without them, but let's get back to the portal. Diving into the navigation of the device itself, the portal is very simple to get started with and use. Upon starting, you simply connect to your preferred Wi-Fi and download the latest update and then find your PS5 to turn it on. And I found that this takes about 20 to 30 minutes upon initial startup. But once you're connected, booting up is very quick anytime you wanna hop on the game when your PS5 is already in rest mode. The menu of the portal is extremely simple and mimics the aesthetic of the PS5 menu. And to navigate, you simply swipe from the top right and it brings up your quick actions that show the PS5 you're connected to, your PS Link headset connection, brightness bar, airplane mode toggle, and settings selection. Diving deeper into settings, you'll find the network options for editing your Wi-Fi connection, system settings to change stuff on the portal itself, more display and brightness settings, controller options that allow you to change vibration and trigger feedback intensity, and that's about it. Once you're connected to your PS5, then you have full access to the console and it's just like you're looking at it on a TV. Now let's go through its performance. One of the things that allows the portal to come in so relatively cheap at $200 is due to the fact that it doesn't rely on powerful internal hardware to play standalone games. So performance is completely dependent on both your portals and your PS5's connections. In fact, it uses a Qualcomm Snapdragon 662 eight core chip that is usually found in low to mid tier mobile gaming setups. So the portal is really not relying on internal hardware for performance at all. But one thing to note is that no matter how good your Wi-Fi is, you do have to get used to a small amount of input delay as I found that even when my connection was very solid, it just felt like there was a couple of milliseconds delay from what I see happening on the portal screen. And the difference is slightly noticeable compared to a normal controller and a TV. Also network stuttering rears its ugly head quite often. So playing anything competitive is pretty much impossible. Now with that said, the portal's network performance has nothing to do with the device itself, because even using your phone with Sony's remote play would also provide 
have the exact same experience. So this is definitely not a knock on the portal. And I actually found the experience to be quite nice overall. Now I'd like to dive into what I like about the portal, what I don't like, and then my final thoughts and if my opinion has changed on it. Starting off with the portal's pros, I really like having a standalone device to play my PS5 with. Using a phone or tablet with remote play is an option that I really enjoy having, but just having something laying there and ready to pick up and play is a nice experience. And it's also nice because then you're not having to put your phone in do not disturb mode and you don't have to worry about notifications ruining your gameplay. It turns the PS5 on remotely and connects fairly quickly if the console is in rest mode so you can get into an already open game within about 30 to 40 seconds of awakening it. I also found the battery life to be quite nice. It uses a 4,370 milliamp hour battery and estimates say you can expect around seven to nine hours of battery life. And I actually found that this to be quite accurate. Again, it's not using hardware to play games. So nothing you play is really going to cause a difference in the battery life because the system won't change how hard it's working. But you can do some simple things like lower the screen brightness, vibration and trigger intensity to slightly increase the battery life. And it also charges quite fast because within 20 to 30 minutes of charging, I can get a few hours of gameplay out of it. Another thing that I like about the portal is how good the speakers are because they get surprisingly loud for the tiny little holes that the sound comes out of and they sound pretty good. The portal is well built, it looks good, and does what it's designed to do very well with excellent haptics and gameplay experience. But I do have some things that I don't like about it and some concerns with it that I want to share as well. And to be clear, my goal is to share dislikes that are portal specific as saying that I don't like the ergonomics of looking down to play handheld games or network instability, that just wouldn't be a fair point. But I will start off by saying that I hate the grips. I kind of touched on this a second ago, but the DualSense handles are something that I've disliked since the PS5 launched because of how the tapered ends are of each handle of the controller and how short they are. The portal is no different than those DualSense controllers, so I find it very uncomfortable to use for long periods of time because my pinky and ring fingers literally have nothing to hold on to. And that's why I like companies like C2 Grip so much because it solves that problem and hopefully they do provide options for the portal as well in the future. Another con for the portal is not having the ability to stream games. This is a huge knock on the portal. Services like Sony's own PlayStation Now would be fantastic to use on the portal and immediately double its value. And if the rumors turn out to be true and Game Pass does become available on the PS5, then the portal would become almost a necessity for the full PS5 experience. But as it stands right now, you have to play whatever the console itself is playing and I haven't heard any solid evidence that streaming will be available anytime soon. In fact, I'm not even sure if it's a simple decision for the portal to have this ability on Sony's part, so we're just gonna have to wait and see. Another thing that I dislike about the portal is that you can only use Sony's gaming headsets on it and not third-party Bluetooth devices. Now, I obviously understand the business move behind this, and I am also aware that you can pick up USB-C dongles to plug into the portal to change this, but it's just a decision that showcases that Sony might not have with the consumer's best interest in mind, which is a reason that I'm kind of concerned about them having a monopoly with Game Pass in the console gaming arena. Now, moving into what I'm concerned about, but it's not necessarily a dislike, is how well the portal will hold up with constant use. I go through about a controller a year currently, and the portal is the same exact build quality, so I am interested to see how much life I get out of it. But I will give Sony a shout out in this regard, because thanks to iFixit's teardown video, I learned that the portal is actually much easier to repair than a standard DualSense controller, because Sony opted to do things like, instead of soldering the joysticks down, they simply unscrewed screw that so that you can replace them if you do have joystick drift, which is probably going to be inevitable for the portal. So I definitely appreciate this aspect and it does increase my confidence a bit on the portal's lifespan. And finally, I would like to summarize my experience with the portal and address my viewpoints in my last video to see if they've changed at all. I said in my last video that one of the reasons that the portal was created was to keep the PS5 relevant in 2023 in order to prep Sony for the slim launch and then the inevitable PS5 Pro release that should be launching later in 2024. On my next point, I caught a lot of heat for because I also said that it was created to dip into the handheld gaming market that blew up in 2023. Now, I totally understand that it is not a direct competitor, but that doesn't mean it wouldn't catch similar attention in a year that was filled with amazing handhelds. Filled. Filled with amazing handhelds. And so due to this, I called the portal a Sony cash grab that was just benefiting from the environment of the handheld gaming war because Sony could have put more into it than they did. But after having hands on it for a few weeks, do I still feel this way? 
Yes, I still think all of my points are true. The Pro is scheduled to release this year and here's the PS5 still on the spotlight because of release timing. And I still believe the portal caught more hype than it normally would have because so much of the gaming community's attention was looking right at the handheld scene. And again, I say this fully understanding that it is not a direct competitor. And yes, I still think the portal is a cash grab from Sony. And what I mean by this is that Sony could have given us much more with the portal, but instead went with the bare minimum in order to ride the wave of handheld gaming in 2023. They could have easily given us an OLED display with cloud streaming gameplay capabilities and third-party Bluetooth support, but didn't. And of course, the easy argument to that is that then it wouldn't come in at the affordable $200, but those upgrades could have put it at $300 and it would still be worth it. Like I said in my last video, unless you want to get a third-party dongle, it's an extra $100 to $200 just to have a headset to use, which increases the price of the portal just to make it competitive, but still doesn't give a better display or increase to versatility. So with all of that said, do I actually like the portal? Hell yes. I've never been so conflicted on a product because I actually love using it. It's well designed, simple, gives a great experience, and I find myself picking it up to play more often than I expected. Some of the most common comments that came from my last video was from dads with kids who dominate their TV time, and the portal gives them the opportunity to game on the couch in the same room and still spend time with their kiddos. And wouldn't you know it, as a dad with a young kid, I found myself in that exact scenario and I was so happy that the portal existed. But if you should actually purchase it is a totally different story. $200 is not bad at all for the portal, but if you take something like the G8 Galileo from GameSir that I recently reviewed that comes in at around $70 to pair with your phone, it's a fantastic device for PS Remote Play and it's difficult to justify the extra $130 for a standalone device that is essentially a one trick pony. You can get almost the exact same experience for less than half the cost if you have a phone already because gameplay experience will be similar just on a smaller screen with a less functional controller. So for my recommendation, I would say purchase the portal if you want the portal specifically. If you just want Sony Remote Play, then know that you are not limited to just the portal at $200. But it's still a great device and it is worth the money if you value what it offers specifically. Be sure to subscribe and join the Freaky Tech family if you haven't already and leave a comment down below if you agree or disagree with my assessment of the portal. But thank you so much for watching and I really appreciate you spending some time with me. Again, I'm Corey with Freaky Tech Reviews. I'll see you next time. <laughs>